Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I thought maybe we get back to the Bible ifs. It's been a while since we got into the Bible ifs, and remember, it's for instruction and righteousness. Can we learn something from it to apply it to us today? Okay. So if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, and that's where we're going to start with our, where we left off with our next Bible if. And we're going to read down to 34. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gregesians, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to tor torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils brought him, saying, If thou cast us out, there's our Bible, if, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they had, were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their way into the city and told everything and was, and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. So the Bible, if there, is coming from uh, possessed, demon-possessed, devil-possessed people. So, for us today in Instruction Righteousness, I want to talk about casting out demons there for a second, okay? You know how to cast out devils today, the number one way to cast out devils today? By leading someone to Jesus Christ, salvation, getting saved, okay? Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, we read, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Okay? These people serve Satan. Okay, we call them, we always point out people online saying they're servants of Satan. False teachers, false prophets, people claiming to be Bible-believing Christians when they're not Christians. Okay, and I believe some of them are demon, devil-possessed. Okay, um, the thing, the other thing about this is, is you have people standing in the pulpits saying, "And I did this as a lost person professing to be saved," but mainly we're pointing out the people behind the pulpits. They'll say, "God showed me," capital G, "God showed me." But when you look at what they're teaching, it doesn't line up with Scripture. It lines up with the world. So it makes you wonder, who is really speaking to them? Maybe it's the lowercase g God of this world. That's who's speaking to them because it's not God. Okay, capital G God. But I've done that too when I was false. I'd say, hey, look, I think, you know, God showed me this. I was using Bible perversions. God showed me this. God showed me. It wasn't God showing me. I wasn't saved. I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me. So what happened after I got saved? Ephesians chapter 2, 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you go from work that's reprobate, that's bad, to good works. What's the? I'm just showing the contrast there. Bad works often uh, come from, when it comes to religion, being religious, bad works often come from servants of Satan, almost all the time. There's a time where I could slip up and make a mistake, where you fall into the trap of what I call, uh, Brother of Christ showed me, uh, PWC, Polly won a cracker. In other words, you're parroting what somebody else has said, and you haven't looked it up for yourself. But when you look up for yourself, you're like, whoa, I was saying something that was wrong. I ain't saying things that way anymore. I'm going to stick with the scriptures. You can screw up like that. But I'm talking about people that are just vehemently, I want to preach against the Bible, Bible version issue. King James Bible is not God's perfect written word. They attack major doctrine. They attack the Godhead. 
They attack the true gospel. Okay? They have bad works. Their fruits are evil. And 1 Corinthians 10, 21, it's talking about, I'm going to talk about someone who's saved. Can someone who's saved be devil-possessed? 1 Corinthians 10, 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord table and the table of devils. No, when you get saved, you cannot be devil-possessed, okay? That's the thing that gets us when we're looking in line and we're watching these charismatics, uh, it's a charismatic cult, and people in them, they're like, I can heal. And you see all these people flopping around and everything. And they're like, we're Christians. We're Christians. They're demon-possessed. They're devil-possessed. Why? Because you, they're not drinking the cup of the Lord. What's going on there doesn't line up with Scripture as far as what, what applies to a Christian, how a Christian acts. It lines up with Scripture on how the lost world is, servants of Satan, demon-possessed people. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Right? As a Christian, you can fall away. You can get tempted. You can get deceived. But God will show you the truth eventually. If you're truly seeking truth, He'll show you the truth. There's things that I held on to from my lost life to being saved. And God had to open my eyes and say, Hey, some of that stuff you were taught as a professing Christian, it's not truth. Okay. What does it say there? God perpetual will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. No, it says acknowledging of the truth. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Can you be de demon-possessed as a saved sinner? Absolutely not. Can you be tempted? Yeah. Right. Can you fall into temptation? Yes. But you can't be de demon-possessed. Right. What's the number one way? Getting saved. When, someone, when you lead someone to Christ, if they were having problems with possessing, being possessed by demons, nightmares, what, when they truly get saved and born again, uh, any demon or, or devil, it says, resist the devil and he must flee. They're gone. Mm -hmm. uh, Say, 1 Timothy 3, 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. That's written to saved. Mm -hmm. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is written to save people. Be sober. Be vigilant. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Remember we read up there about false apostles, deceitful workers? He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay. Notice we talked about there. Uh, whose end shall be according to their works. Okay, I'm still a sinner, don't get me wrong. This isn't saying that if you're saved, you've got to be sinless. What they're saying is the ways of the world. Jesus came in to fulfill the law of sin and death. He overcame the law of sin and death. He overcame death. Okay. Can you still be tempted by Satan? Absolutely. Uh, those who... But here's the thing. The lost... Matthew, I just wonder why I put these down. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, a curse and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay? We know where the devil's going to go. Second okay. Peter three nine, the Lord is not slacking concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You need to get saved. If you're lost and you come across this video, you need to get saved. You need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. That's the whole point of this part right here. Instruction, rightness, brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't be demon possessed when you're saved. And the number one way to cast out demons today is 
getting someone saved, leading them to Christ, answering the call when it comes to the ministry of reconciliation. Okay. Another thing I wanted to point out in this for us today is people's reaction to someone getting truly saved. Because here it's about someone, demons getting cast out. But for today, someone truly gets saved. They can be tempted by Satan. They can be led astray by Satan. But they can't be possessed by demons. Devils is another word. So what was their reaction to what Jesus did? Okay. Uh, the herdsmen ran into the city and came back with a the mob. They were scared. They ran into the city and they came back with the mob. They didn't come back by themselves. They didn't come over and talk to Jesus after that happened. They ran to the city. So, Matthew chapter 10, verse 25. It is enough for the disciples that, ye, that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Okay. You get saved, you become part of his household, Jesus. You become, cross, become part of the body of Christ. Okay. There's going to be a difference. People are going to treat you differently. They're going to be scared. They'll try to act like they're not, but they're going to be scared. They're going to run off and talk to other people. And they're going to try to come back with a mob. You know, some people talked about how some of their family members would bring their pastor to come talk to them. So the family members wouldn't confront them. They went, they got scared. Oh, I just, I'm scared for him because I feel like he's a part of a cult now. Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, and they're a part of a cult now. So they get scared. So then they run and talk to somebody else, a pastor, somebody else, and then they come back with more than one person, a group. We've got to talk to you. Right? And oftentimes, uh, if you're part of a Bible-building system, a church building system they'll do that those steps and then if you say hey i'm sticking to the word of god the real jesus christ what do they do they ask you to leave okay. john 15 18 if the world hate you ye you know that it hated me before it hated you yeah okay uh, oftentimes you'll find people in your life that when you get saved born again they go from being okay with you, loving you, man, you're cool, you're awesome, the world's words, you're cool, you're awesome, uh, to almost hating you, what's going on. What we're talking about here, I'm not saying you're guaranteed to be devil-possessed before you get saved, but a lot of the people around you, they're in, the, they're in the snare of the devil, they're the enemy. That's why the Bible calls them the enemy, because Satan is the lowercase g God in this world, and he can use anybody that rejects Jesus Christ. Right. Matthew 10, 34. Turn to Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the man's foes shall be they of his own household. A lot of people like to stop there, but we're going to keep reading. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Okay. Another verse I didn't put in here just came to mind. Remember when he sends the disciples out. Okay. Those people, the city, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, if they receive you, let your peace become upon them. If they reject you, let your peace return to you. In other words, they kick them out, brush the dust off your feet, and you move on to the next city. And that's, gonna, that's our reaction. As Christians today, we preach the gospel. They don't want to hear it. You move on to the next people. Okay. So, instruction of righteousness for the Bible, if there. Salvation. You want to see a devil get cast out? Lead someone to Christ. Okay. That's the number one way, I believe. And remember, and see the reaction. You brothers and sisters in Christ, I know a lot of you have testimonies out there on the change of your, when you got saved, the change in your life, but you also have testimonies in the change of other people towards you. How they reacted and how they treat you now. Right. So the next Bible if is Matthew 9, 9 19. So we're going to jump down to 9, 19. Okay. 
And Jesus rose and followed him and said, And so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. There's our Bible if. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Okay. Bible if. If I may but touch him, touch him, I could be healed. That's the condition. Much touch him, be healed. So there's the Bible F and the condition. So instruction of righteousness today. Okay. First, I want to make a point. Uh, Mark chapter two verse seventeen. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So how do we know this woman came in a broken state? That she was broken? Because she wanted to be made whole. I mean, there's still people that will attack that and argue that point. She wanted to be whole. She knew she had a sickness. She's broken. And she wanted to be made whole. Today, that sickness is sin. You want the cure? It's Jesus Christ. So, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Let's talk about the being broken part. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Okay? You have to come to God broken. Now, this is a Bible if, okay? If I can touch his robe, I can be healed. And I'm not, what we're going to talk about now, I'm not saying she was doing this. She actually came to him broken. But in the lost world, how many times do we come across people that say, um, if God was this, then why is this happening? If God was a loving God, then why would he do this? You know, or if God would do this for me, then I'd believe you know, how many of you come across those kind of people? Right? Uh, come across a lot of those people. Matthew 12, 39. If God would just show me proof. If God would just show me proof. Then I'd believe. There's another one. Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. This is the Jewish people. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So we see that the Jews want, require a sign, an adulterous and uh, an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Now we're going to get on the Gentile side, the Greeks. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay. So we see here signs, adulterous generation, seeking after wisdom, ever learning with no truth. If God will do this, if God will do that, you know, why isn't God like this? Why is God like that? If God was like this, if God was so loving, you know, I could go on and on. Okay. What's going on there? If God would just prove himself, if God would do this, for me, I would believe. I, I, I you know, evidence God, or selfishness. God would do this for me. There's times where we get tempted to do that, like in the Old Testament. You know, God does this. I trust Him. You know, they do that. They'd be like, you know, the fleece was one of them. About the water on the fleece, and then the water was all over the ground, and the fleece was dry. If you do this, then I believe what you're saying is truth. And then again. Uh, James, and it's all about signs and adulteresses. Uh, James 4.4 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The world's way, you know, give me a sign, give me a sign. Adulterous and perverse generation seeketh after a sign. That's the world. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 3.19 for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, 
He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. That goes back to the Gentiles, but in the world today we see this a lot. People want signs, they want proof, and they'll try to convince themselves in words, they'll try to con con how does the right word? Convince them out of conviction, talk them out of conviction. Okay? They'll try to ask all these questions to try to talk themselves. They're not really asking you questions because they want to know the truth. They're trying to talk themselves out of conviction. They're trying to talk themselves out of coming to God broken in true repentance. Okay? Now, are we supposed to be like this woman today? When it comes to being broken at salvation and even in your life as a Christian, when you find that you've dropped your cross and you fell into sin and temptation, you need to come to God broken. Okay? When it comes to this, yes. But remember, as a saved sinner, for, we're doing this for instruction and righteousness today. Are we supposed to have the attitude of, if I do this, God will do this? Remember what she said, if I touch him, then I can be made whole. Okay? If, I, if God will do this for me, or if I do this, maybe God will do this for me. You know, is that how we're supposed to be today? Well, if you turn to Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. You want something, you ask Jesus for it. There is no, if God, if I do this, will you do this for me? Or if God does this for me, then I'll do that for him. No, you need something, just ask God for it. Now, can we ask him for anything? First John 5, 14, and this is the... 1 John 5, 14, sorry. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition, petition that we desired of him. See, we can ask anything. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, you're, gonna be, you're probably saying, wait a minute, you left out the most important part of that verse. And a lot of people do. Let's go back and read that important part. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will. It's got to line up with his will. Oh Lord, I want a million dollars. Is that line up with his will? Lord, I want five or six cars, some sports cars, some of these trucks. Does that line up with his will? Okay. It's got to line up with his will. If it does... You can ask anything that lines up with God's will, according to God's will. Okay. That's how we're supposed to be today for instruction and righteousness, what's going on here. We're supposed to just flat out ask God, and it has to be according to His will. But just ask God, hey God, I'd really like this, I need help with this. Lord, I really need help with that. Lord, I could really use this. Or even something like, Lord, I don't need it, but I kind of want it. Could it be your will, Lord? And oftentimes... No, every time, God knows what he's doing. Do you trust God? Hopefully you do. So when you ask for something and you don't get it, are you trusting God that he knows what's best? There's a reason why you didn't get it or it didn't happen. Okay. So the next Bible if, Matthew 10, 11. Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. And we're going to read on down. This is, if you're reading, let's go back up to 7. He's sending out the disciples. Let's go back to 7. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The millennial kingdom. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, and saying those plural, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. 
and there abide till ye go hence. And when ye come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, there's our Bible if, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Right. The words. Right. For instruction righteousness today, trying to talk about the best thing that that could talk about for today, we're preaching the gospel. If you look in here, the gospel, the kingdom of God is spiritual. Okay, it's not in meat and drink. So we're preaching the gospel today. Okay, and we're to go out and preach the gospel. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all, the, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Are we to go out and preach the word? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, peace come, we're going to talk about peace coming upon it and receiving you, people that are receiving you when you preach the gospel. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1. We are all called into the ministry of reconciliation. We're all called to preach the gospel. I came across a professing Christian woman once and her attitude was, I don't, I don't feel that I'm really called to preach the gospel. And I looked at her and was like, but the Bible says that we're all... We're given. We're all called into the ministry of reconciliation. You read it right there. All things are of God who hath reconciled us, that's saved sinners, that's every brothers and sisters in Christ, by himself, to himself, by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. She didn't like that. Some people that you come across these false converts, they, why would you hate preaching the gospel? I don't get that. Well, I get it because they're lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Now, I have courage to do it. Before I want to throw that in, sometimes it's hard to have courage. Sometimes God opens a door for you and you fail him because you didn't, you, you got scared or something. I understand that. Okay, God will give you courage over time and he will help you overcome that fear, you know, of co confrontation and whatnot. Because in these last days, most times it's confrontational when you're preaching the gospel. It's not all pleasant. 1 Corinthians 3, one, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Why did I read that verse? Because when you lead someone to Christ, you don't just say, Oh, praise the Lord, you're saved, praise the Lord. Now get out of the way, get out of the way. Next. You have a responsibility to that person. Remember what we read up there where it said, uh, your peace come a problem. When you get to part out of the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet, you get to part because they reject you. If they don't reject you, you preach the word to them. You instruct them. Okay, You lead a babe in Christ in the right direction. Here's a King James Bible. If you want to, here's a Webster's 1828 dictionary. Here's a concordance. Ignore the Hebrew and Greek. The front is just where you can look up words, and it'll tell you wherever they are in the Bible. But here's the Bible. It's going to have doctrine in it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The changed life, you point, point him to this. You teach him the milk. You give him milk. Afterwards, you start pointing him towards the meat. Okay? Three types of studies you can do. Word study. Uh, subject study or expository study. Okay. You tell them what those are. Word study is simple. You look up a specific word and you go through the Bible finding out every time that word's used what's the context. Okay. Subject study. You're looking up a specific subject and try to find that subject all throughout the Bible and see in the context. Expository studies where what I'm doing now in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, you're going verse by verse and trying to get, it's basically you're doing word studies and subject studies just going verse by verse in a certain part of the Bible, okay? You're doing the whole chapter, and you're finding out what everything means. That's an expository study. You're, so you're to teach them, okay? You're to lead them and guide them, all right? You don't brush the dust off your feet and move on if someone gets saved. You don't say, ah, oh, okay, get out of the way. Brush the dust off my feet, and I'm going to move to the next city. and Just leave that person there. 
No, you don't do that. Okay. First Corinthians. Okay, the peace come upon it. First Corinthians, first uh, chapter one, verse three. This is Paul. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul led the Corinthians to Jesus Christ. Not all of them, but the Christians in Corinth is the city. Peace be upon you. Okay. Uh, you'll find this first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy. Okay. I wanted to point this out in first and second Timothy. You also find mercy, peace and mercy, Titus, peace and mercy. You have Philemon and then second John also says peace and mercy. Okay. But peace come upon you. When you lead someone to Christ, the peace that God gave you now comes on them. They get the Holy Spirit in them. Mm -hmm. Now, peace returned to you. Let's do some examples of that. Okay. People ask, and I'm going to go through this, but people try to ask, how often do you preach the gospel to somebody? Let's read this. Titus, chapter Titus, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 10. Titus 3:10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. And people will say, well, you see there, at first and second admonition, I'd only preach it to him twice and then move on. Well, let's look up some words. Heretic, okay? And, strictus, and strictness among Christians, a person who holds and avows religious opinions contrary to the doctrines of Scripture. The only rule of faith and practice, anyone who maintains erroneous opinions, okay? If you're trying to leave, lead someone to Christ that's never heard Christ or heard of, of a Jesus Christ, they're not religious, how does this apply to them? They're not a heretic because they're not religious. They don't know about Jesus Christ or anything, but they don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. Okay? Admonition, something to learn about admonition. It's gentle reproof. Counseling against a fault. Okay. What, is, what do we do as Christians? We're to confess our faults one to another. Okay. We're to do reproof, gentle reproof. Instruction in duties. Instruction in righteousness. Um, you know, we already just talked about one, the ministry of reconciliation, something we're supposed to be doing in our lives. Caution, direction. Okay. Admonition is only used three times in the Bible. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for an example, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world are come. It's written to Christians. Okay, admonition, our admonition. Okay, Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we see that it's used for kids, and it's used for saved people, okay? I believe kids that are under the age of accountability, that God will not impute, God would not impute sin to them, okay? They're going to go to heaven, okay? They don't, if they don't know that they've sinned against God, how can they come to repentance? Okay. It's that simple. So it's used for two people, saved and children, so when you go back to Titus 3.10, a man that is heretic after the first and second admonition, if someone is flat out lost and you're preaching the gospel to them, does that really apply? I know some people that like to grab that and use that. Okay? More than anything, I think it applies to uh, saved. Like we said before, PWCs, you try to correct them. The Bible says that you can be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit, and fall into the trap of after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and you're not following Christ. You drift away from this book and following Christ. Okay, you can be spoiled through philosophy. I've known people that I believe are saved that have been spoiled by the rudiments of the world, by traditions of men, by philosophy. Okay, vain deceit, someone deceived them. Oftentimes it's because people are too lazy to read the Bible. They become PWCs. Okay? Uh, this man told me that. This pastor told me that. It's got to be true.
Okay, take some time to read. Right? We read those two. But there does come a time to dust off your feet and move on to the next city. Okay. There is a time. So am I saying that you can do it a million times? No. There's a time where you got to say, okay, I've preached the gospel to him a couple times. Okay. At this point, Lord, it's in your hands. Someone else might come along. You've planted the seed. Someone else might come along and preach the gospel to him. And they're watering that seed that you planted. Okay. You might preach the gospel, try to do it a couple times. Like a neighbor wants nothing to do with Jesus Christ. A couple years down the road, a door might open. He might ask you a question that opens a door and you can preach the gospel again to him. Are you to have the attitude of, well, nope, I've, run, I've done my two times and I'm done. No. If God opens another door, get you in there and preach the gospel. Now, are you supposed to be beating people over the head with the gospel? i got to go preach the gospel to my neighbor every day. got to get over there every day. I got my sign. I've got my megaphone, and I'm going to preach the gospel to them every day. Are you supposed to do that? Absolutely not. I always tell people, and this is a good example of it, what we're reading here about the disciples, brush the dust off your feet. We, as Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, we are not car salesmen. Okay? We're not. We present the gospel to people. If they want it, they'll take it. If they don't want it, then they don't take it. We move on. We don't try to twist and twist and try to say it a million different ways and twist it and everything. And Well, maybe if I say it this way or maybe the next thing you know, you start compromising and start, you know, sin maybe not hit hard on sin or try not to mention hell. I had someone, a family member tell me that you shouldn't mention hell when preaching the gospel. Compromise. Maybe you could win more souls if you take hell out of the equation. You know what I mean? So... There is a time to preach the gospel, which is all the time, but there's a time to say, okay, I need to brush the dust off my feet. I need to move on. Start preaching the gospel elsewhere where someone might be more willing to hear it and not get stuck on one person. Okay. But you also have to be careful that people that like to talk a lot with questions after questions. How many people have done that? They get uh, trapped in discussing religious things because and you start out by wanting to preach the gospel and the next thing you know you start talking about things in the bible which that lost person is not going to understand they don't have the holy spirit in them and somehow they strayed you from the gospel or even if you're still staying on the gospel they just have question after question after question you're going to find out when you get saved the reason they do that is they're trying to talk themselves out of getting saved okay question after question after question titus 3 9 but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contention and striving about the law, for they are an unprofitable and vain. Foolish questions. Sometimes they're going to ask questions that are sincere. Okay? But a lot of time you're going to come across people that they're asking foolish questions because their questions are designed so either you don't have the answer so they can say, Aha, I got you what they call straw man arguments, where they're trying to force you to give them the answers they want. Or, like I said, they're just trying to find a loophole. They're trying to find a way out of getting, having to get saved the Bible way. They like the world's way of getting saved. This false Christianity that's just running amok throughout the world. Uh, Brother in Christ, I think it was 33rd book. He has a YouTube channel, 33rd book. He doesn't use Christian anymore. He says he's a Bible believer. And the reason he doesn't really use Christian anymore is because that word has been tainted and that word has been misused so much in this world. He's right. He's absolutely right. Okay. You have people that ask questions because they are seeking truth, and then you have people that ask questions to ask questions. Okay. Uh, they're trying to, I already said this, they're trying to find a fault in you so they can justify them not getting saved trying to talk themselves out of getting saved. Okay. Second Timothy 2.12 And the whole point I'm trying to point this out is when you realize that that person's not ready for salvation, they're not broken, they're not asking questions from the heart out of sincerity saying, well, yeah, I need this. Where do I get this? I know I have no peace. And, you know, I don't have this. And, you know, my life is a mess. You know, what do I do? These are good questions. And you lead them to Jesus Christ. Well, if Jesus, God is such a good God and a loving God, 
why would he send a good person to hell? I had a neighbor that he wasn't mean like that, but he, he can't get over the fact that God would send a good person to hell, a nice person. He used to work at the uh, um, prison, the local prison. And a lot of evil and wicked men in there, sinful men. I'm one, but he couldn't understand the fact that I'm equal to them. He couldn't understand how some of them were getting saved and getting to go to heaven, and yet good people are going to hell. They've never done what they did. Okay. But when you have people that ask a lot of questions, you've got to get to this point of understanding. They're not ready for salvation. What do you do? Do you keep going with them? Second Timothy 2.22 Flee also useful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Okay, what happens? Online, brothers and sisters in Christ, how many of you have gotten trapped in debating and arguing with false converts? I'm raising my hand because I'm one of them. And I try so hard to just link the gospel and move on. But there's still times where I fall into the trap. I think it starts out, we're just discussing in fellowship. And it turns out the person's lost. And no matter how many answers you give them, they don't want the truth. They want to believe what they want to believe. And they want to distract you by getting you into an argument, into a debate. Okay? You're the foolish and unlearned questions you're to avoid. Okay? So, Isaiah 55, 6. Something to throw out there real quick. Right? Dust the brush off your feet. When you're telling these people, in this Bible if, if you're telling these people about the truth, here's the thing that as we're saved, I'm going to read two verses. Okay? We're going to start Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. The gospel's out there, remember? We read up there, uh, gosh, I can't remember. All men, basically the all the gospel has been pre is there for salvation is there for all men. You just gotta come to Jesus to get it. I can't remember what verse we were on that had that. But you're seeking the Lord. Today's the easiest day time period to get saved. Okay? The easiest time period. So seek the Lord while you may be found. And you have people that complain, really, i got to seek the Lord? Well, how about this? If you don't want to seek the Lord, how about this? Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. If you want to turn there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Remember what Paul said, if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. But how many of us, brothers and sisters of Christ, when we got saved, we realized that, A, we started seeking the Lord, and we wanted truth, and God brought us to truth, absolute truth, that after we got saved, we looked back that even though we were seeking the Lord, He was knocking on our door the whole time. He was there throughout our whole life, knocking on the door. Oh, I, why didn't I listen to God then? I, I kind of rejected the gospel then. I rejected truth then in my life. Someone came in my life to teach me truth then. God was knocking on the door the whole time. You think you were seeking Him? He was knocking on your door the whole time. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter four four. Okay. The reason um, when you're going out to preach the gospel, a lot of people aren't going to want the truth. They're just not. You're going to be dusting the, you're going to be brushing the dust off your feet a lot because a lot of people today just do not want the gospel, the true gospel, the gospel that says that you are a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner on your way to hell and that you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God, and that you need a savior, and that savior is Jesus Christ. They don't like the true gospel. They like the gospel of, oh, just believe. Just believe, and it's about love. Just love, love, love. Right? They like the world's way. Right? When you try to preach the true gospel, uh, it's never going to always go over well. And when it does, you wonder why the angels sing praises, I sing praises, other brothers and sisters of Christ sing praises over one that gets, that's, gets saved. Okay. 
2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world, lowercase g God, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The true gospel. There's a false gospel going around, and that's the one they're going to cling to. They won't want the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's our Bible ifs for instruction in righteousness. I want to just say grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.